Tonight on News 5 Live, more details on the fatal traffic accident that claimed the life of an American tourist and injured several other family members. Commissioner of Police Chester Williams admits gross negligence in, in the holding cell suicide of Jose Espinosa. And a fire on Arlington Drive reportedly caused by a mentally ill patient displaces a family of three. Details of these stories and more coming up in tonight's newscast. No tricks.
evening. Welcome to News 5 Live for Friday, November 29th. I am Marlene Cuellar. A red Ford van carrying a family of American tourists on Thursday afternoon flipped several times on the Philip Golson Highway in the Orange Walk District. 77-year-old Carolyn Moxley Gillis, a resident from the state of Georgia, was flung out of the vehicle between miles 41 and 42. She died instantly. Also on the van were 79-year-old John Gillis, who received injuries to the right ear, an abrasion to his left hand and bruises to the right arm. 45-year-old John Milton Gillis Jr., who received minor injuries to the left arm, 43-year-old Lynette Gillis, who received abrasions to the back, and 10-year-old Mary Clara Louise Gillis, who complained of pain to her neck and head. 10-year-old Carolyn Gillis and 13-year-old Rylan Gillis both complained of injuries to the neck and back. Driving the van was operator Henry Gillett, who, according to police, lost control of the vehicle after suffering a blowout. What the police know so far is that the van at the time was being driven by Henry Gillett of a Belize City address and uh, he had taken a group of tourists somewhere in the north and was returning to Belize City when he apparently suffered a blow out to the right rear tire which caused him to lose control and the vehicle overturned several times during which Miss Gillis was flung from the vehicle. Um, several other family members, um, six to be exact, who had also been in the vehicle were also or received varying degrees of injuries and uh, some of them are hospitalized at the Northern Regional Hospital along with Mr. Gillett. He had so far been served with a notice of intended prosecution. Gillett has been released from the hospital. A second fatal traffic accident was recorded on Thursday, this time in the south. Police were called out to Santa Cruz Village in Estan Creek District where they saw a Hispanic man lying dead on the southern highway. The unidentified victim was knocked down and killed while riding his bicycle between miles 24 and 25. At the scene, police observed a badly damaged vehicle which was driven at the time by Walkie Jacobs of United Vilcayo. He told police that his vision was impaired by an oncoming vehicle, causing him to hit the cyclist. Police responded to an information of a road traffic accident um, shortly before 6 a.m. this morning between miles 21 and 22 on the Southern Highway, which would be in the vicinity of Santa Cruz Village. Um, upon the police's arrival to the scene, a Hispanic male was seen motionless with severe head and body injuries on the right-hand side of the highway when traveling south. And a little distance away was a damaged bicycle and a gray Toyota pickup. Um, the driver reported to police that he was southbound and the vehicle coming in the opposite direction um, impaired his vision with its headlights and in the process, he did not see the bicycle rider until he was too close to avoid an accident, um, which caused him to knock down um, that individual who so far his identity remains unknown at this time. Jacobs is detained pending investigation. The number of deaths associated with recent road traffic accidents is alarming. Commissioner of Police Chester Williams says that the police department will be working diligently to enforce highway laws in an attempt to prevent further accidents. We are seeing that the traffic fatalities on our highways are becoming more and more prevalent. It may have a lot to do with the improve on the highways and uh, drivers driving in such a way that they are not paying as much due care as they should. We will be embarking on a campaign starting today where we will have enforcement on the highways. We do believe that the time has come that 
we need to go back and play a more active role in traffic enforcement. So just today I directed the Commander National Traffic, Mr. Stevens, to ensure that every day we have a highway patrol on the Philip Golson Highway and one on the George Price Highway. As a part of that, what they'll be doing as well is to issue traffic safety pamphlets um, that drivers can use as a guide in terms of how to use the highways safely. And so we are hoping that drivers are going to take heed to the warnings. And I also want to appeal to drivers that when on the highway, if it is that you're going to overtake, please ensure that there is sufficient distance for you to complete your overtaking and uh, try not to take no chances. 67-year-old retired police officer Eduardo Wade was among the seven persons who died in the horrific traffic accident on Wednesday afternoon. Wade was inside a red SUV which was being driven by his daughter, Lourdes Wade, who also died along with Myra Alcocer. The trio was heading back to Belmopan when Lourdes attempted to overtake a car, slamming head-on into a white passenger van which was being driven at the time by Errol Dial, a well the crash ultimately killed three American tourists and four Belizeans. Eduardo was a retired assistant commissioner of police who greatly influenced police commissioner Chester Williams. Williams says that an official police funeral will be held for Eduardo, who gave decades of service to the force and country. It is only fitting that not only for what he did for me, but what he did for the department and the country, because I'm sure that many would agree that he served many years with distinction and honor. Um, he was a no-nonsense type of officer. And so it is only fitting that the police department give Mr. Wade the final respect. And so we are going to have an official funeral from Mr. Wade. The police department will be having the funeral just as if he was a serving member of the department. So we'll do our best to bid him that final farewell and final respect that he rightly deserved after having served this nation for over 37 years as a police officer. An internal investigation is underway into the death of Jose Espinosa. He was found dead in a holding cell at the Queen Street Police Station on Wednesday evening. Espinosa reportedly committed suicide two hours after being detained. Investigators say that he hung himself with his shoelace. Today, Commissioner of Police Chester Williams told the media that there is some degree of gross negligence on the part of the officers who dealt with Espinosa. I have directed an internal investigation into that matter. From what I have been briefed, um, there is some degree of gross negligence on the part of the officers who dealt with the detainee. And I have referred the matter to Professional Standard Branch and the trips will fall where they may. On Sunday, November 24th, a gunman sprayed the Martins residence on Antelope Street extension with bullets. That same shooter shot one-year-old Melanie Martinez, who was asleep in the house, and 23-year-old Mervyn Martin and his girlfriend, 16-year-old Chantus Martinez who were near the gate. Investigators say they have arrested the shooter. On Thursday, a male minor was charged for the crime of attempted murder. While Martin and the toddler have been released from the hospital, Martinez remains hospitalized in a critical condition. Investigators, however, have yet to determine a motive. On yesterday, police have since arrested and charged a 16-year-old male minor in the presence of his father for three counts of attempted murder, three counts of use of deadly means of harm, three counts of dangerous harm. Any motive, sir? Um, at this point in time, no. Is he we the, haven't been able to establish a motive. Is he the sole person that police are looking at? Um, at this point, yes. Um, if you can recall, police had initially detained two other persons. Okay, and uh, the young lady, is she, do you know her condition? Um, she still remains in a critical condition and the other two persons have since been released.
Coming up, two fires gut a residence on Arlington Drive and Ordones Street.
A family of three was displaced following a fire this afternoon on Arlington Drive in Belize City. Charles Castillo believes that his mentally ill brother is responsible. The National Fire Service was notified and responded quickly to prevent the fire from spreading to nearby structures. News 5's Duane Moody reports. Just after midday, a fire broke inside a two-bedroom elevated wooden structure on Arlington Drive off Farber's Road Extension in Belize City. The house, which is occupied by three persons, was completely gutted despite efforts by firefighters to extinguish the blaze. From the distance, we could have seen heavy black smoke, so we knew something was burning apart from garbage or the norm. Um, when we got here, the remains of what you see in the backdrop was full engulfed in flames. Um, the heat was threatening the nearby two houses that you can also see in the background. Uh, our team quickly got into operation trying to contain and extinguish this fire before further structural damage could have been done. The house is the property of Charles Castillo, who lived there with his mother and another relative. While the house was locked, Castillo says that his brother Francis, who is diagnosed as a mental health patient, was left in the yard. He believes that his brother set the place on fire. If you phone me and tell me if I know what, my house is on fire. I tell I never know. But he say he coming right now, go check on it, no? Can he say fire pump there right now, no? He try out it, no? Tell us about what you saw when you got here. Oh, when I get there, well, the three M's is, they, then they work on it. Now when I get here, they don't know it already. I just see how the house may look. Only the one where he had, no correct. Only he and me left from in the yard, man, before I gone. Only he made the walk around the yard. Yeah, as usual, no? Yeah, because nobody else never the home. Only he. What do you think could have happened? Well, to my knowledge, he lit up the kerosene stove that was downstairs. Then the flames burst through to the floor, no? He gone upstairs. This particular fire um, have led us to believe that it was an intentionally set fire by person or persons unknown at the moment. Like you rightly said, the investigation is still ongoing. <clears throat> but what we can tell you is that forcible entry was apparently made from the front of the structure whereby um, some form of accelerant was used to enhance this fire. Uh, the perpetrator or perpetrators, um, they tried to destroy an entire block within this within this yard which contained three houses several houses that are in proximity to the gutted house were scorched by the blaze station supervisor kenneth mortis says that were it not for assistance from residents in the area the damages could have been worse we had the assistance of nearby um, residents who were quick to assist indeed you know the damage could have been by far much more than what we have left standing. Castillo says that neither the house nor the items inside were insured. He is asking for assistance to replace what was lost. Like boards and thing, yeah, we need boards and thing, yeah, uh, zinc and thing, yeah, really would have need it, yeah, because I see with nothing, everything I destroy. Dwayne Moody for News 5. There was another fire earlier this week that gutted a wooden house off Ordono Street in Belize City. Mauricio Garay reported to police that his newly built house did not have utilities installed as yet, but in the wee hours of Wednesday morning, it was reduced to ashes. Reports from the area are that a carpet left outside by a neighbor was used by the arsonist to light the place on fire. Today, Garay's mother came to News 5 asking for it. I got the news um, when Wednesday morning. At around nine, my son called me and told me, Mom, my house got burned down. And it was really shocking for me because we, 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 did, we didn't finish the house all that. He didn't finish the house all that. Only thing left, left him to, to do is his veranda. And it was really devastation for us because we are trying. He is trying to finish his house to get in it. And they just put it up in smoke. Did your son complain of having any issues with anybody for them to want to do something? No, no, no. No issue. He did he didn't have no issue. How do you recover? How does your son recover from this? Um, assistance maybe from the public? I Well, I'm asking for a little assistance because you know it's Christmas time and we want to try to build back. I'm really asking for a little assistance for my son to get back his house. Anyone who would like to assist can contact her at 
610-630-9300. Millions of dollars are expended annually for employment injury by the Social Security Board. It gives rise to the need for the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Bill, which was read in the House back in 2014. Today, the SSB hosted an Employment Injury Forum. The purpose is to create awareness, sensitization, and prevention of employment injuries at work, as well as to promote health, safety, and well-being. News 5's Dwayne Moody files this report. Discussion continues on the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Bill, which was tabled in the House of Representatives back in 2014, but has still not been made law. Despite the five-year delay, both public and private sector entities have been dialoguing on what is best for the employer and the safety of the employee. Today, an employment injury forum hosted by the Social Security Board brought together all stakeholders to create awareness and promote safety and well-being at the workplace. It's intended to uh, engage employers and employees in the need for us to advance the OSH legislation uh, because we do believe that a focus on workplace safety, occupational health and safety, is beneficial for employers, it's beneficial for employees and also for the Social Security Fund. We have and we're sharing a number of, of uh, statistics today with the participants for them to be able to see how employment injury impacts their social security fund, but also how it impacts the lives and families of employees. And that oftentimes the benefit that they're paid from social security, depending on the extent of their injuries, is not sufficient to cover uh, their uh, cost, as well as to maintain their quality of lives. Employment injury has cost the Social Security Board over $53 million over the last 12 years, $5.7 million in 2018 alone. The OSH legislation would allow SSB to put in place minimum requirements to help protect injury, which CEO Dr. Colin Young says would make the organization more efficient in its services. What was presented would be onerous uh, to employers. And so that is where I think the conversation is being had between the two sides. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, whatever it is that is agreed between the, the labor side and the employers, that it can be phased in over time. That we start somewhere and then we get to where we want to go over time. That is cognizant of the fact that some of what is being asked uh, to be included is going to be costly. And, it, and there will be adverse impact on the employer side. At the same time, employees' lives are, you can't put a price on that. While it is the responsibility of everyone to be safety conscious, the employer takes the lead since it's their workplace and the brunt of the cost is majority on their pockets. And that has been met with reluctance. The Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry is the official representative of the International Labour Organization in Belize. That organization focuses on the safety of employees at the workplace. Member Relationship Manager and Occupational Safety and Health Trainer Yorsha Belkatus says that while employers are concerned about the investment, there are inexpensive measures that can be implemented in the workplace. The employers, they don't want to always pay more because you're in the business to be really product, productive, and efficient and effective. Workers also don't want to pay more than they pay because the more that they can take home for their families, it's better for them. And the government, the largest employer for the country, of course they don't want to pay more expense, right? So it, that's why we have been doing the consultation so that we could work out something that is amenable. The chamber also participated. We got a scholarship from ILO. They gave a scholarship to seven countries, Belize was one of them, and the scholarship was to get training on, uh, it was like 27 different important topics that you could come back to Belize and help our employers to implement some safety measures, and some of these measures don't even cost a dime. The informational session sensitized participants on the importance of preventing accidents at the workplace. Dwayne Moody for News 5. After the break, Baja conducts a simulation exercise for banana disease in Georgetown.
Today at the Built More, the Belize Trade and Investment Development Services Beltrade, through its Small Business Development Center, hosted the fifth annual Entrepreneurship Convention. It featured keynote remarks from the founder of the Caribbean Center of Excellence for Sustainable Livelihoods, as well as several panel discussions, as well as an expo of several local businesses. News 5's Isani Caetano was on hand and files the following report. Engage, exchange, empower. It is a theme of this year's National Entrepreneurship Convention, Entrecon. In its fifth year, the gathering of stakeholders with a common interest in financing new commercial enterprises has seen over a thousand participants sharing knowledge, best practices, and expertise. Entrepreneurship is, is that vehicle that is driving the economy, and many times we don't focus on it enough. It also creates employment, but it, it, so what we're doing here today, it's a convention where you bring entrepreneurs to interact with other businesses, right? So people interacting with each other, people sharing, and, and at the end of the day, so it's like a showcase because the Small Business Development Center of Beltrade does this throughout the year where they advise uh, from startups. Um, we also have programs where they can access different benefits. But here is a case as a convention where you bring and you listen to you listen to speakers. We just hear from you know Sean Quillen. You will hear from another you know, speaker that we invited, and to encourage, to empower, to exchange because too often we might have ideas, but we are afraid to bring them out or take the risk or take the chance or afraid of failure. Since its establishment in 2014, Entrecon aims to bring together key stakeholders and experts from a network of businesses at the local, national and international levels. The event supports business development in the ever-changing globalized marketplace. It's extremely important that we have young, young people and young entrepreneurs involved in the ecosystem. So there is this entrepreneurship ecosystem, like most other things, and there are many stakeholders involved in that ecosystem. And young people, as one of the stakeholders, is vital. Because again, we talk about complementing. We were all put on this earth together to complement, not compete. Again, I strongly believe that is why we're failing. Um, nothing wrong with failing, unless we keep doing the same thing over and over again. So for young people to be exposed to entrepreneurship, and not just entrepreneurship, but the entrepreneurial principles and thinking, it's vital because even if they don't start their own businesses, they become more productive citizens of the country and of the region. Minister of State Tracy Panton is responsible for investment, trade and commerce. Bell Trade has been really working on a very comprehensive approach in how we um, implement the conditions and the environment and a, and a culture for entrepreneurship in the country. And we feel that those seeds are best planted in our young people so we can nurture those seeds and help them to grow. Entracon is really culmination of a month of activities um, that have been organized by Beltrade but also by other interested stake partners in trying to promote entrepreneurship in the country. It is an opportunity for those who attend the conference to uh, share their ideas and stories to learn from those who already are entrepreneurs um, so that uh, we can develop the best practices for Belize and be able to develop a strong network of entrepreneurs throughout the length and breadth of the country. Along with Galen University and Digi, a scholarship value at $30,000 was also raffled during the event. Reporting for News 5, I am Isana Cayetano. Four police officers were today recognized for their exceptional work in fighting crime. They are CIB officer Corporal Cassandra O'Brien, PC Lennox Castillo, PC Frederick Frazier, and Corporal Brizenia Chub. The women, the woman and men were recognized for the crucial role they played in the murder investigations of 30-year-old Giovanni Lennon, which took place on Thursday night, November 14th, and Zeng Lu. 18-year-old Denver Bevins and 24-year-old Joseph Acaro have been charged for the murders, respectively. Chester Williams, Commissioner of Police, spoke of the award. You know that as a disciplined organization, we are in the habit of disciplining officers to ensure that they toe a straight line. But equally, we must also be that department that is 
quick to reward our officers who perform exceptionally well. And under this administration, we believe in ensuring that when our officers do well, that they get the recognition that they so deserve for the good work that they do. Well, we try to do it as often as we can, um, so long as we have a situation where an officer has done exceptionally well, we waste no time to reward that officer or those officers. And today is one such day where um, the murder of Mr. Lennon took place about um, two weeks ago, and then the one in Mr. Zeng just over the weekend gone. And so we decided to put two of the incidents together and we have one ceremony today. The exceptional officers received cash and a certificate. World AIDS Day is held each year on December 1st. It is an opportunity to celebrate and support global efforts to prevent new HIV infections, increase HIV awareness and knowledge, and support those living with HIV. This year, the focus is on communities that help to make the difference for those living with HIV. Since December 1st falls on a Sunday, the National AIDS Commission observed the global event today across the country. We stopped by the Digi Park this morning for the activities in Belize City. Andrea Polanco reports. The theme of this year's World AIDS Day is Communities Make the Difference. It is an opportunity to recognize the critical role that communities have played and continue to play in the AIDS response. The National AIDS Commission says that today's observance of World AIDS Day brings together a number of community partners because their work is critical to addressing this epidemic, especially at a time when there is reduced funding which impacts services and advocacy for HIV AIDS communities. From a mental aspect, when you're first diagnosed with HIV, who do you turn to for advice, for even telling your story? You know, so that's why we have the other organizations out here to link how, who they can go to, who they can speak with um, and get advice on that self-acceptance of, okay, my life will change, you know, I need to be aware of the NCDs that will affect me because my immune system is a bit weaker than the average healthy person. And that is the reason why we have different organizations out here. It, uh, it is also a way for us to um, develop a private public partnership because our Global Fund is in a transitional stage so Global Fund will not be around forever and we want to have these organizations on board for when that time comes. One of the partners of today's open day is the Voluntary Counseling and Testing Center. They're offering the rapid testing. It is quick and easy. You give your personal information and a quick prick on the finger collects a blood sample that is used in the strip. Laverne Marin, of the VCT explains the services when taking a rapid test. For the person that is non-reactive, we talk about remaining non-reactive. For the person who is unfortunately tested reactive, we will definitely explain that that is not the positive test. There are other tests that need to be done for the confirmation. And the person who is reactive is given um, the opportunity to do quarterly their physical. People prefer to the concept of the physical, so we're looking at the heart, liver, kidney functions, as well as the um, viral load and CD4 testing. The, the process is um, only five minutes for the testing portion of it. Having done the uh, intake here, you sit with a counselor and you get your results within that period of time. A series of similar open day displays were carried out across the country as the National AIDS Commission observed World AIDS Day activities in place of Sunday, December 1st. Reporting for News 5, I'm Andrea Polanco. There's more news after the break, so...
In Thursday night's newscast, we showed you part of Baja's plans to keep the deadly banana and plantain disease out of Belize. The preparation, as reported, includes surveillance and containment simulation exercises to test the country's readiness should the disease be. While it is not a new disease, a recent detection in America has put the region on high alert because the varieties of banana we have in Belize are susceptible to the fungal infection. So Baja is reviewing its plans from surveillance to containment. And on Thursday, they carried out an exercise at a banana farm in the south so that they can improve Belize's prevention plan. As you may know, there is no cure for the disease and the best defense is prevention. The TR4 is called by many as the worst banana and plantain disease of the century. That is because it can cripple entire industries and it spreads very fast. Reporter Andrea Polanco tells us more about Baja's containment simulation. Biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity. And that's at the heart of the Belize Agricultural Health Authority's simulation to test to run its readiness to contain the Fusarium oxysporum tropical race 4, also called the TR4. It's a fungal disease that affects bananas and plantains. It causes affected plant leaves to become yellow and wilted, and the plant stops bearing and dies. Fungicides can't control the TR4, nor can fumigants get rid of it from the soil. If the disease is not contained quickly on a farm, it can wipe out an entire industry. Banana industry, as we know it today, would not be here if this comes in. And uh, the technical people have told us that, uh, that this study has been done and this disease moves at uh, the rate of 100 kilometers per annum. So when it's identified in a country, like one of those Asian countries, Thailand, for example, there are thousands of kilometers. So it moves at a, at a rate of 100 kilometers. The whole banana belt is within 100 kilometers. So one year and everything would be infected. And Belize's $80 million industry can collapse if it ever becomes infected with a TR4. The foreign exchange earnings and trade opportunities would disappear. It will also take with it the livelihoods of thousands of Belizeans. The idea of not ever having fried plantain with your rice and beans is also very real. So this potential banana and plantain devastation is something that not even the industry players want to think about. It would be a, a major blow. Um, so our thing is not even to think of getting the disease to Belize because this is, it would be like a, a big setback for the, for the industry. So the attitude, the spirit is to is prevention. So to prevent it from getting into Belize, Baja carried out a simulation of a TR4 case on a banana and plantain farm in the banana belt. The scenario is this. Agriculture officials have received word that a plant is showing signs of TR4. So they must test to confirm this case, destroy the diseased plants, and contain this deadly fungus to the area where it's found. These protocols start at the farm gate. All vehicles and inside floor mats, occupants' footwear as well as tools going onto the farm are disinfected. Once on the farm, everyone puts on protective gear and goes through another biosecurity station. When on the plantation, the technician inspects the suspected diseased plants, gather data and attaches an identifying marker. A lab team extracts a small sample from the suspected plant and carries out a series of sanitization and security measures of the tools used. The sample is secured and carefully labeled and stored to be tested. Confirmation of the deadly fungus sets off a series of immediate containment steps in this red zone. The plant is cut down and chopped into small pieces and then stored in bags with urea and white lime to act upon the fungus. All other plants within the plot are also destroyed because those are infected too. The sample area is sealed up. Clothing is discarded here and the plot is covered up because it can no longer be used to plant bananas and plantains. For the simple fact that the disease lives in the soil for 30 to 40 years. Today was a practice run for us to gauge where our weaknesses, our little mistakes, for us to be able to, to tweak that and, and tune it. So the basic uh, principle behind uh, the approach is that you come in clean and you leave clean so that you do not move the fungal organism to another area. Because there is no room for error in this, in this particular case. There are as many as seven different ways that this fungus spreads. The two most common ways are by infected planting materials and the movement of contaminated soil. 
While the disease is not in Belize, the threat is very real. With the TR4 now in Colombia, if strong surveillance and preventative measures are not implemented, it can be just a matter of time for Belize. If it gets into Central America, it becomes even worse. Uh, because then we do depend on labor from Central America. So the whole region is, 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 is on alert. How bad it's happened before. If in the in the 1920s to 1950s, 60s, there was a similar epidemic, but of Fusarium, tropical Fusarium race one. It is another variant. It's present all over the Americas. It killed the banana variety at the time, known as Gros Michel. It disappeared. It killed the industry all over Central and South America. They had to shift to a new variety, which is the Cavendish type variety that we have. But the devastation was so huge. If it happened once, it can happen again. And it's going to be worse because this variant kills even plantains. The first one didn't, this one does. It kills everything that is banana, plantains, uh, commercial bananas, everything. So we are extremely worried, it's extremely serious. And it's that seriousness that has prompted banana farmers to also do their part to protect their farms. Our growers are very um, much preparing themselves, uh, is, um, putting in place some levels of biosecurity measures already. Um, a major one is limiting people um, to come to their farm. Um, before we have suppliers, they will come direct to our farm and offering products to, 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 to the growers. That has stopped. They will just reach as far as the Banana Growers Association. And also any local person, does, um, before people come to the farm and want to be selling stuff and things like that, and all those, those steps, those things are banned now. Baja will be reviewing the simulation and other exercises carried out this week. Surveillance and a public education campaign will be a part of the next steps to help keep TR4 out of Belize. Reporting for News 5, I'm Andrea Polanco. Baja's efforts are not being done in isolation. It is part of a regional readiness effort because if it gets into one of the countries, the chances of it spreading across the region is almost guaranteed. So the regional body OIRSA has been providing support to Central America, where countries have been carrying out similar exercises to keep the disease out of the region. Officials from the organization went along to observe and provide feedback on Baja's simulation. Here's what they had to say about the country's preparedness. We have these programs that are going on to strengthen the capacity that the local competent authority has. We know they are, they are limited in resources. We ourselves are limited in resources, but coming together, we can support and do this type of activities, building capacity for them to react, when to react, and how to react. So our, our assistance here is capacity building, supporting all our member countries, and Belize is the last one to do this simulation exercise so that whenever it comes, the competent authority can be able to react. And this is just the initial. We have more to come to fine tune all what they have done. With this exercise, we detected some, some errors, some slight errors that we have to, 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 to fix and, and better it up for the next coming simulation. After the break, a special edition of Healthy Living that looks at HIV. Smart customers.
While December 1st is World AIDS Day, today activities were held across the country offering free testing and education on HIV prevention. Over the years, there have been targeted messages for vulnerable populations, from young girls and to men who have sex with men. In a special edition of Healthy Living, we discover that there's one population that seems to be left out of these targeted campaigns, even though statistics show that they're very much at risk. The following report looks at HIV risks within people over 50. I'll soon be a centenarian. And at this time, to learn something about that, get out of here. <laughs> uh. And that reaction of 94-year-old Leotine Gillette to the idea of HIV education may seem logical to many. In fact, she was about 50 by the time HIV became well known. It is in the 80s that I first saw manually somebody suffering from it. And then I got all the information from it, and that was in New York. And when I came to Belize, I realized that it was here, but it was a girl who was suffering from it. From the 80s to the present day, Belize has been recording new cases of HIV each year. While health agencies, both governmental and non-governmental, have made great strides in being able to reduce the number of new infections and increasing knowledge, it seems that information may have skipped a key population. We do have cases whereby we have early as newly diagnosed cases. Dr. Natalie um, Bruce is a medical that? doctor at the BFLA Primary Care Clinic. It's estimated that currently 17% mm -hmm. of the newly diagnosed HIV cases are found within the ages of 50 and older, mm -hmm. and that is expected to increase by the year 2020. These global statistics are not far off from our own numbers. It's something that concerns groups like HelpAge Belize that are working with elderly population. I looked at the 2016 data and I saw in 2016 there were 45, approximately 45 new cases. And in 2017, there were 35 new cases between the ages of 50 and 65 plus. That is concerning. Even though the over 50 age category would account for 15 to 20 percent of newly diagnosed infections in the last two published reports, there's no data available that tells us how or when these persons over 50 acquired the virus. It is believed that some of these cases are only detected in the later years. Because they had never become, they had never tested, you have at times whereby they might be showing symptoms, but those symptoms are not associated with they are not thinking about HIV. Mm -hmm. They would test for something else before yeah. they test for HIV. So that would usually be the last thing yeah. that we would take into account. Here at BFLA, we try to create an integrated approach where we will offer HIV testing across the board, mm -hmm. granted that we get the consent of the person. In the 2017 HIV surveillance report, which is published in October 2017, this very issue is noted. The report said, the elderly do not actively seek HIV testing, so they're being detected in the late stages of HIV when they most likely present with an opportunistic infection or disease and then are screened to rule out HIV infection. It went on to say, Looking at the rate of infection in the elderly males and female population, screening opportunities similar to those in the younger age bracket should be provided. You don't see it in marketing to encourage older person to get the HIV test done. You don't hear of older person being asked to do an HIV test. Screening should be done at all ages. And I think it's very important because the Ministry of Health statistic is showing persons 50 plus, 65 plus positive HIV. One barrier is the assumption that as people age, they stop having sex. Both Bulwa and Dr. Bruce agree that this is a misconception. Back in the days, in terms of the elderly, they would be more confined to the house. Mm -hmm. But you find now that the older you find them, they might be older looking younger, they're taking a healthier approach to life, they're living longer and so they're able to do, live a more vibrant life and that life also entails 
sex and persons come to you and they will talk ask you question and they're trying to get affirmation of certain risky behaviors that they are engaging in and you recognize guess what we need to look at providing information and education as for the aging population itself well naturally some will be more open than others whoever with my age and still do it better take a least take a little test yeah nothing wrong with that they had it at the y different times mm -hmm. and i told miss feeling now rest sonia little that's not for me that's not a wrong <laughs> that <laughs> i can't even spell condom <laughs> much more to tell you what it is used for. And while her response may seem comical, it does show that the HIV education efforts may need to extend its reach to all populations. The education classes that happen for the elderly are not geared towards um, HIV, yeah. nor HIV testing, nor prevention, because we're assuming that they already know, or we're assuming that we do not need to target them because they're not having sex. The statistics is showing that work needs to be done and if it's estimated that there will be that increase then we need to make sure that we're targeting everybody in terms of that nobody gets left behind. That's the news. Don't forget that tonight's broadcast is available in both text and streaming video at channel5belize.com. You can also connect with us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news5live. I'm Marlene Cuellar. Thanks for joining us. And from all of us here at News 5, have a happy and safe weekend. Good night.